So intriguing uh, uh, title. Uh, can algebraic graph theory help to find a good block design for experiments? And it was said uh, by Rosemary that just in seconds we will know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this enjoyable workshop. So, I'm going to give you some motivation now. I'll give you some more motivation at the end. So part of my motivation is some talks we heard early on in the workshop. In Wim Hamer's, his talk, he said, what does the spectrum of the Laplacian matrix of a graph tell us about properties of that graph? And I'm interested in this question for special graphs that arise in design of experiments. And then a bit later on, we heard Misha Muzichuk and he was saying, I, this, is, this is not verbatim, but something like, what insights or problems can algebraic graph theorists gain from work in statistics? And I wasn't quite sure whether he was being happy or annoyed that statistics sometimes provides a different viewpoint. So that's one of my starting places. So I'll start off with an example of an experiment. Um, so what I want to do is do an experiment to compare six varieties of cabbage. And this is a real field. It's a field in an agricultural research station where I used to work. And you can see here I've got some stony ground and that might affect the way the cabbages grow. So let's say, okay, stony ground might be a bit different. Let's choose six plots there and make a block. Now, at the edge of the field, you can see these trees. And we knew from experience that there were birds, some crows that live in these trees, and they would sometimes come in and eat the crop. So the plots at that end of the field might be a bit disadvantaged. So then I just go on and put six and six in close together. And this is a standard way of going about thing. Partition your experimental units, plots here, into things called blocks. Each block should be as homogeneous as possible. And in this case, we can plant each variety on one plot in each block. So when I'm talking about block designs, I don't mean quite the same thing as a combinatorialist means. I have V treatments that I want to compare. We say V because we often think of varieties, but I'll call them treatments. I have B blocks and with K experimental units in each block. And in English, it's easy to remember this because B and K are the first and last letter of block. Now, in my field example, the experimental units were actually plots, but they might not be more generally. And what's different from the combinatorial approach is these blocks and experimental units are real things and they exist. And then I have to decide where to put the treatments. So in the example that we looked at, we had four blocks of size six. The blocks were made up of contiguous plots and our treatments were cabbage varieties, there were six. Now I want you to imagine a second experiment and we've got some new wines, 16 of them, and I'm going to invite some professional wine tasters to come along, 12 of them, and taste some of the wines and give them a score. Now, am I going to give you 16 wines to taste? And you're going to give fair scores? Well, of course, professional wine tasters spit it out after they've started, but all the same, 16 is too many. And it would be much more plausible to give each wine taster only four, which is smaller. So then my problem is given these numbers, B and K and V, how should I choose a block design? Well, 
To answer that question, we have to know what makes a block design good. So I'm going to let you think about this for a bit. Supposing I have six treatments and my resources are six blocks of size two. So I can show them like this with just as a graph with the edges. And somebody proposes this design. One is joined to two and to six and so on. Somebody else says, no, no, no. Let's put in something else boring. We'll call it a control. And our six blocks, each thing will be compared once with the control. If we were in a real classroom, I would ask you to have a vote. <laughs> I just ask you to decide now, and then I will go on and you can see which side you belong to. If you're a statistician, what you say is we must always use all treatments as equally as possible. So you would go for the one on the left. If you're a biologist, you know that you must compare all treatments with the same thing. So you'll go for the one on the right. Now, who do you think's right? Well, actually, both of those sayings are not quite true. The one on the left is true if there aren't any blocks. But if there are blocks, it might not be true any longer. And the thing on the right, it's a misunderstanding of people like me saying, well, it's no good if you test treatment six now and go and compare it with anything, but then look at what you did to treatment one 10 years ago when things were different. So both of these mantras are not quite right. So we still don't know, which, well, I am not telling you yet, which is best of those. So I'm going to show you a few block design so I can define some words. My convention for the moment is that I will show blocks as columns. It might be rows later, but I hope the boxes will make it clear. The order of the treatments within each block is actually not relevant because I can make it random later. And which block is which is also irrelevant because I'll make that random later. So if we look at these two designs here, um, part of the reason for showing you two different designs for the same numbers of um, treatments, blocks, and so on, is I can define some things. And you will see here that this design is binary, and that means no treatment occurs more than once in a block. Whereas here, we've got a design that isn't binary, because we do allow treatment one to come twice in that first block. And combinatorialists often don't even think that that's a possibility. Now, here are two designs, still with seven blocks of size three, but now we've jumped up to 15 treatments. And if you look at them, they're rather different. The replication of a treatment is the number of times it occurs. And if you look in this one, some things come twice, some things come once. So the replications are as equal as they can be. Over here, we've got one really bossy treatment that comes in all the blocks. And this is not the conventional terminology. There isn't one. I call a treatment like that a queen bee if it's so important that it has to come in all the blocks. But this is just me being a mathematician and saying I'm going to use a word to mean what I want. Now, still seven blocks of size three and seven treatments, two different designs. And now this is the concept that probably most of you will have come across before. We say that the design is balanced if it's binary and every pair of distinct treatments occurs together in the same number of blocks. Now, if you look here, one and two come together once. Five and six come together once. And of course, you don't believe me, you're all doing a quick check in the background to make sure that's true for all the pairs. Over on the right, one and two come twice. So I think if we do a little check. If one comes twice with something, 
that means there's something it never comes with at all and if we have a look where does one come it never comes with four so that's balanced designs so that's just to give you some idea of definitions now i have to tell you a bit about the incidence matrix and then we'll get on to graphs so b blocks of size k so we've got bk experimental units so if i've got an experimental unit i usually call it by a little greek letter and there's a treatment on that and there's a block containing it so i'm going to call those f of omega and g of omega for each treatment i r sub i is going to be the replication of treatment i that means the number of experimental units where it occurs. And for a treatment I and a block J, N subscript IJ is going to be the number of times that, that treatment occurs in that block. And so then these numbers can be put together into a V by B matrix N, and this is called the incidence matrix, and that will be familiar to some of you. So now I'm going to go on to that and something called the Levi graph. When Vim was talking about this earlier in the week, he called it the incidence graph. So this was um, a German mathematician who was working in Calcutta in the 1930s and 1940s at the in the agricultural place there he thought of these um, graphs so we have one vertex for each treatment we have one vertex for each block and for each experimental unit there's an edge and it joins the treatment on that experimental unit to the block containing it. So it's a bipartite graph, no edges between treatment vertices, no edges between block vertices, and the number of edges between treatment vertex i and block vertex j is precisely this incidence number nij. So I'll give you a few examples. Here's a very little block design four treatments in three blocks of size three. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm using black dots to show the treatments and I'm using white squares without labels to show the blocks. That will become clear, I hope. So if you look in this first block, it contains treatments one, three and four. So we draw an edge between one, three and four to that block. The next block contains treatments two, three, and four. So we put edges between them, and this represents that block. So this block in the middle has got to be for that one there. And I invite you to draw the edges in your mind before I show it to you. Here we are. There's one edge for one. And because treatment two comes twice in that block, we actually get two edges there. So the sort of graphs that I'm dealing with are allowed to have multiple edges. Here's another example, not quite so small. And it makes this very nice picture here. Treatments one, two and five are in the first block. Two, three and six are in the second block and so on as we go round. So that was the first graph. The second graph is something called the concurrence graph. This time we have just a vertex for each treatment. And for each, this is how you make an edge. Take an ordered pair of experimental units that are in the same block but with different treatments, then that gives you an edge 
joining those two treatments together. And we don't allow loops. So the number of edges between treatment vertices I and J, we can get this by doing things with those numbers in the incidence matrix. And we get something called lambda IJ. And this is number is called the concurrence of I and J. Now, if the design is binary, this is simply the number of blocks where I and J both occur. And I put these all together in this matrix capital lambda. So if we go back to our small example, there was the Levi graph. Here is the concurrence graph. So we only have vertices for the treatments. Um, and so one and three, we get just concurrence one, three and four, we get concurrence two, one and two, we get one concurrence from that and another one from that. So because this is not binary, we can have those two edges there, even from the same block. So you can see now a difference between these graphs. This one really tells you exactly what the design is. This one doesn't, because you can't see whether the double thing is one and two or three and four. But it does have more symmetry. And as you all know, having symmetry often helps with what we need to do. This one has more vertices, so that seems to be a bit of a pain. But actually, as soon as k gets to be more than four, this one has more edges. And so I usually find it easier to do my calculations in the Levi graph. So we'll look at that example again. There's the Levi graph. Here's the concurrence graph. So what you've got here is one, two, and five in that triangle, two, three, and six in that triangle, and so on. Now, in this case, you could recover the design from it, but you usually can't. This is one of the examples I gave you before. Now, this is the one that the biologists would like. It's my queen bee design. Here's the queen bee sitting right in the center being important. Every other block is a triangle that just contains one and two other treatments. In this case, we've still got all the blocks being triangles. There's one, two, and three. There's one, four, and seven, and so on. But now you've got the pictures there, you can see that they do look very different. Well, Vim was telling us earlier on in the week about the Laplacian matrix of a graph. But I'll just remind you. So for the concurrence graph, the Laplacian is just a V by V matrix where V is the number of treatments. If I and J are different, what do you put in this matrix? You take the number of edges between I and J and put minus in front of it. So that's minus lambda ij. And on the diagonal, you put the valency of i in the graph. So that's the sum of these lambda ij's for different j. So doing this, what you put on the diagonal is the negative of the sum of everything else in that row. So you're making the row sums zero. Now we do something similar for the Laplacian of the Levi graph. So now we have V plus B, so number of treatments and number of blocks. And what are we going to put? On the diagonal, we'll put the valency. So if I is a block, that will be K. If I is a treatment, it's the replication. Off the diagonal, 
you put minus the number of edges between them. So if they're both treatments or they're both blocks, you put zero. If one's a treatment and the other's a block, you put minus the number of times that, that treatment comes in that block. So as I've said, all row sums of those matrices are zero. So both of those matrices have eigenvalue zero on the all one vector. And now here's a standard linear algebra theorem. The following things are equivalent. Zero is a simple eigenvalue of L. That's the same thing as G being a connected graph. Well, that's the same thing as the Levi graph being connected. And that's the same thing as zero being a simple eigenvalue of that. And all of those are equivalent to something which a statistician would describe as the design being connected, which means that I can estimate all of the differences between treatments. How much better is treatment one than treatment two? Everything like that. So I just assume connectivity from now on. The other eigenvalues we call non-trivial, and you can show that they're all non-negative. Well, sometimes I need to invert this matrix. It's got one zero eigenvalue. So this is my trick for doing that. I take my matrix. Now, the zero eigenvalue, its eigenvector is the all ones vector. And this matrix, the all ones matrix divided by V, is the orthogonal projector onto that subspace. So if I add that orthogonal projector onto L, then I've got something where that's got eigenvalue one there. Now I can invert it. When I've inverted it, I just take that guy off again. So what I've done is essentially invert L where I can. And this particular nice thing is called the Moore Penrose generalized inverse. And you do something similar for the um, Laplacian of the Levi graph. Okay, so I've told you about graphs and the Laplacians. Now I'm going to talk about two ways of saying whether the graphs are nice. The first one, I'm going to pretend that my graph is an electrical network with the resistance of one ohm in each edge. I take a battery with one volt and I connect it between two vertices. Then current flows according to some rules. Ohm's law says in every edge, the voltage drop is the current times the resistance. Um, but we've assumed that all the resistances are one. So if we take the units off, we just get current. Then we have Kirchhoff's two laws. One says the voltage drop from one vertex to another is the same no matter which path you take. And his current law says that if you've got any vertex not connected to the battery, the total current coming in is equal to the total current going out. So you can find the total current from I to J, use Ohm's law backwards, and define the effective resistance between them as one over that current. And there's a nice theorem that says the effective resistance can be obtained from the Laplacian by that formula. I like having this way of thinking about it though, because you have to invert a matrix to get that, whereas this you can often calculate just by looking at the picture of the graph. Here's an example to try and convince you of that. It's one of the graphs we've seen before, and I want to know the resistance between four and six. 
So I start off here in blue. That's going to tell me the voltage. Now I'm going to send a current up here. Now I'm afraid this is where this shows how I'm not really a physicist. I'm sending a current and it's going up. It should be going down. So you just have negatives everywhere. I send a current of five. So this voltage is five. Current of five coming in. So current of five must go out. So this voltage is five more, which is 10. So from zero to 10, that current has to be 10. Now I do something in this direction and I've cheated a bit because I've gone ahead and worked out that I need to send 336 and then 336 again. Now from 10 till 12, so I've got to send a current of two there. I had 15 coming in, that leaves 13 to go out, that voltage is 23. So here we had um, um, six plus three plus two coming in. So 11 going out, 11 plus 12 is 23. And so the magic I did to make that three was to make sure I got the same answer there both ways. And once you've got that, your final voltage difference is 23. The total current flowing is 24. And so you get your resist effective resistance as 23 over 24. Well, there's another nice theorem that says, if you look at treatment vertices in the Levi graph, then the effective resistance between them there is just K times what it is in the concurrence graph. So there's the block design. That's the calculations we just did in the concurrence graph. Let's look at the Levi graph. We want to go from four to six. Start off going around like that. You see there are five steps. I'm going to have to go three steps that way. So that tells me now that I ought to make all these multiples of three. So if I do three, 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 the voltage difference is 15. And so now if I come along there, It'll have to be five, five, five. So now current coming in is eight. Current coming out has to be eight. And there's my 23. And a similar calculation, I've got that one there. But it's actually much easier to do it. So now something about the statistics. I haven't got time to go into the statistical reasons for this, but there are different ways of saying why a block design is good. And one of them is called A-optimality. A block design is called A-optimal if it minimizes the average of these resistances that we've just calculated in the concurrence graph. And because of that formula I showed you, equivalently, it, manage, it minimizes the average of the effective resistances, only the ones between treatment vertices in the Levi graph. Equivalently, again, and this takes a bit of doing, it maximizes the harmonic mean of the non-trivial eigenvalues of the Laplacian. So we're interested in those eigenvalues. And this comes back to Vim's question, what can the eigenvalues tell us about the graph? Well, we would like to know something about the eigenvalues from graphs of a particular sort. And when I say maximizes, I mean over this class of block designs with given B, given K, given V. So now, don't forget that, but I'll put it on hold for the moment and go and think about something else. You know what a spanning tree is. If we have a graph, I have a collection of edges, which forms a tree. So it's connected, but has no cycles, and it includes every vertex. That's called a spanning tree. And there's a nice theorem 
that says if we have the concurrence graph and the Levi graph of an incomplete block design, a connected one, for V treatments in B blocks of size K, then you can calculate the number of spanning trees for the Levi graph if you know the number of spanning trees for the concurrence graph. You multiply by this power of K. And of course, depending on the size of B and V, one is bigger or the other is bigger. So if you know the number of spanning trees for one of them, you know the number of spanning trees for both of them. So now I'm going to tell you about my second concept of optimality. A block design is called D-optimal if it maximizes the geometric mean of those non-trivial eigenvalues of the Laplacian matrix. So there is a theorem giving you the number of spanning trees in terms of the product of those eigenvalues. So equivalently, it maximizes the number of spanning trees for the concurrence graph. And by what I've just shown you, the number there is just a multiple of that. So equivalently, it maximizes the number of spanning trees for the Levi graph. And again, over all block designs for given values of B, B and K. Okay, now, a while ago, I told you about some properties that block designs might have, and I told you about balanced. Now, statisticians typically use this abbreviation, BIBD, a balanced incomplete block design. Some of you listening might just call this a two design, and some of you might call it a block design because you might not think about the other block designs. So remember, balanced means every pair of treatments occur together in the same number of blocks. And there's a theorem that goes back a long time that says if there is a balanced incomplete block design for these parameters, then it is A optimal and it is D optimal. So not only that, there is no other way of getting an A-optimal or D-optimal design. So just go back. These are your favorites and they're optimal. You can be pleased about that. But what should we do if, you know, I told you we're given B and B and K, what should we do if for the values we're given, there doesn't exist a balanced incomplete block design? So I will tell you some folklore that arose from that. Everybody just assumed the A optimal designs are the same as the D optimal designs. If you want to maximize the harmonic mean, of the eigenvalues or if you want to maximize their geometric mean well obviously you just want to make them all as equal as possible likewise if it's a optimal then obviously its replications must be as equal as possible and if you're still awake remember i told you this is what the statisticians mantra when they're thinking about how we should make a good design And similarly, if a design is D-optimal, then its replication should be as equal as possible. So that's the folklore. Now I'm going to debunk it. And the debunking comes up when we look at graphs with the smallest possible connectivity. So, if you think about the Levi graph, it's got BK vertices, sorry, edges, B plus B vertices. So for that to be connected, we've got to satisfy this inequality. And 
if you satisfy that at the most extreme case, then the Levi graph is a tree. And the concurrence graph is a sort of tree of K cliques, if you think of the blocks making the tree. And that's one reason I showed you these two before. <coughs> This is satisfied there, and you can see here we've sort of got a tree of triangles coming out of that, and here we've got each, you can go from a triangle to another and so on, but you can't get back. So, if we have this extreme case, what is the optimality? The Levi graph is a tree. So the number of spanning trees is just one. So all connected designs are equally good. It's a bit shocking, but it's true. The Levi graph is a tree. If you haven't got any cycles, effective resistance is just the same thing as graph distance. So you can very quickly see that the only A optimal designs are the queen B designs, because the other, otherwise the distances just get huge. So if I go back to my pictures, for D optimality, those are equally good. For A optimality, this one is much, much better than that. And I, suspect that when I showed you this silly design. So let's add one more edge and have V being the product of B and K minus one. Well then if you work out the cycle index you find that the Levi graph has a single cycle. So how do you make a spanning tree you just remove an edge from that cycle. And that's the only way of doing it. So to have the maximum number of spanning trees, the, the designs in which the cycle has the maximum number of edges. So let's look at an extreme case. V is equal to B block size two. So this is now, I'm afraid I'm going back to just showing the blocks as edges because it's easy in this case. And the D optimal designs have the longest cycles, so there's something like this. And on these slides, I'm showing you the A optimal designs for V is C. It's certainly true. This result was found independently by quite a few people and all students thought they'd made a mistake in their computation. Well, let's go on. Hmm, stays that bad. And like that. And in fact, we now know that when you get up to 13, the A optimal design is actually a triangle with all the other edges adjacent to a single vertex of that. And for V equals 12, you can either have one like this with a square, or you can have the triangle. What's going on? Let's go back a bit. Resistance distance. The resistance distance from here to here, one, two, three, four. So that's four, that's four. When you put them in parallel, we get two. As the cycle gets bigger, you get many more where it's bigger than two. Here, all of those are two. That to those around there are a bit less, but you never get anything bigger than two. And that's what's going on, roughly speaking. So for the last section, I'm going to I haven't got time to talk about the whole problem, so I'm just going to talk about the case where I've got some large blocks 
and the average replication is less than two. So now I find it conveniently to write the blocks as rows. If the average replication is less than two, I have to have some treatments with single replication. And again, I'm going to upset the biologists by calling these drones. I just mean these are the lazy treatments. They only come once. So you can imagine splitting up the blocks like this. The whole design has V treatments in B blocks of size K. And K, I'm going to write as K dash plus N. This sub design, gamma, I'll say has V dash core treatments. So I just look at blocks of size K dash. And there may be some extra drones in there because the numbers may not work out nicely. But the thing is, on these final N plots of each block, I've only got drones. And then there's a couple of numerical conditions that have to be satisfied for that. So I'm going to try and show you the Levi graph of something. So we've got some blocks and some treatments, and some of those treatments are drones. So this is a Levi graph of something with four blocks, which I've called A, B, C, and D. And each of these blocks has got four core treatments. So one, two, three, and four, three, six, seven, eight, five, four, seven, eight, one, two, five, six. And in addition to those core treatments, each of these blocks has N drones. So I'm calling them A1 to AN there, B1 to BN there. <coughs> so just thinking about that graph, what can we say about D optimality? D optimality is determined by the number of spanning trees. And you'll notice that the drones essentially don't contribute to the number of spanning trees. If you've got a drone, that edge has got to be in the spanning tree. So the spanning number of spanning trees are determined from the interesting part of the graph. So for D optimality, you've got to concentrate on making that the core part good. But now let's think about A optimality. What's the resistance distance between A1, treatment A1 and treatment C1? Well, there's a resistance of one. Then we've got to do something in the core between block A and block C, and then there's another one. So the overall resistance between treatments A1 and C1 is one plus the block resistance A to C plus one. And using that way of thinking, we actually get this theorem, which goes back a little bit, Supposing there are n drones in each block. The core design has V dash treatments and blocks of size K dash. Now, how do I get the sum of the treatment resistances in my design? Well, there's a constant, and then there's something plus n times something plus n squared times something. Now, this bit. Just look at the sum of the treatment resistances in the core part. So if I go back, that will be treatment resistances like two to four. Now go skip right to the end. We've got an N squared times the sum of the block resistances in gamma. So if we go back, something like this, there's n there times n there. And we've got to multiply by that block resistance. And the final bit in the core graph, we need to look at resistances between a treatment vertex and a block vertex, sum them and multiply by n. And the reason for doing that 
is if, say, I want to know the resistance distance between that and that, I have a one there, and then I have that resistance that I'm getting between a block and a treatment. So I get that quadratic. So consequences of what we've done, as I said, for de-optimality, you want as few drones as possible so that you can get the most spanning trees from the core graph. But if V is large, then N is large. And so you might need to focus on reducing the block to block resistances. Just go back to that picture. No, no perhaps this formula here. When N is large, it's, this is what dominates things. And it's this block to block resistances, which you would have thought weren't interesting, that actually dominate what's going on. And so it might be better to increase the number of drones. That will make the block size in the core design smaller. You might actually make the average replication within gamma more than two, so that we've got some things with replication one and some things with replication three or more. And this is not intuitive. So I'll just, I mean, I have got lots of examples where I've worked out the details, but this is just one. Supposing I've got four blocks of size four plus N and my number of varieties is eight plus four N. Here are two possible designs. So four plus N, three plus N plus one. 4 plus n in each block. So what I've done here, n drones in each block, so that's 4n plus another 8. Here, n plus 1 drones in each block, that's 4n plus 4, is another 4. Now, this design that I've got there, 1, 2, 3, 4, one, two, five, six, three, six, seven, eight, and so on. I'll quickly go back. Is precisely what I've got here. One, two, three, four, and three, six, seven, eight. So that's the one we've looked at. This one, we said, let's go up and that's the design for four treatments in four blocks of size three. And I think you can see this one is actually a balanced design. Every pair of treatments comes together the same number of times and every pair of blocks has the same number of things in common. And you can, I've got the formulae for these and the thing on the left is better at first but when n gets up to 50 the thing on the right is better and as n increases the thing the difference between them gets even worse and there are certainly agricultural experiments where n can be that large so there are some conjectures there's some theoretical work, but it's not completely done. One says that if the connectivity is more than minimal, then all de-optimal designs have their replications as equal as possible. Remember, under minimal, then there's no difference. Now, what about A-optimal? I've shown you some cases where the average replication is less than two, and A optimal is a bit surprising. If you go up to very large sizes, I've done some work, um, and these two people have done some work, and it seems you can go up to average replication three, but very sparse graphs, and that A optimal designs just collapse. 
But from what we've seen, certainly when the average replication is four or more, that doesn't seem to happen. But we have no proof of this yet. So at the start, I gave some motivation, and that was questions posed by other speakers. Now I'm give to give some motivation from real things that have happened to me this year. So when someone asks me to help design an experiment, I say, OK, I know a distance regular graph or an association scheme or orthogonal Latin squares. I can use this. Most other people involved don't have that knowledge. So they simply have some sort of computer program which they ask to search for a good design. And to cut down the amount of work the computer has to do, they typically make some assumptions about the conditions a good design would satisfy. And within, well, within the, since COVID, when everything has been done by email rather than face to face, three collaborators have contacted me to say something like, I wanted an optimal design for this, my computer found that, or I proposed that, what do you think? The first case I replied and said, I've got a better design than yours, but it's not equally replicable. And of course, the collaborator said, well, I never thought of looking for designs that weren't equally replicable. The second one was a bit more complicated. Again, I sent the correspondent a better design from a published paper of mine. And she said, I'm surprised. I know about your core design, so I was looking at them. But two blocks in your design have the same set of core treatments. I'd assumed that that wouldn't be good, so I didn't allow my program to look for things like that. And the third case, I won't go into details, but it was a similar thing. They hadn't found the design because they would made some assumptions that turned out not to be correct. So this is my challenge to you. I've been stuck on it for 15 years now. Given the number of treatments, the number of blocks and the block size, can you find a function and some criterion such that when that criterion is satisfied, programs should relax their usual assumptions in their search for good experimental designs? If you can, that would be incredibly useful. So I'll just finish off with a few references. Um, so I won't spend long on these, but they'll be in the slides. A couple of survey papers some stuff on optimality. This is a standard book on it. A bit about de-optimality and spanning trees and some stuff on a-optimality um, and looking at these rather strange things that can happen. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for your nice talk, uh, Rosemary, and uh, for showing us uh, interesting applications of uh, algebra and graph theory to block design and even uh, to uh, electric networks.